Welcome back to another UFC fight prediction video. In this video, I'll be predicting the main card fights for UFC on ESPN, Smith versus Teixeira. So without further ado, let's get to our first fight on the main card. So in our first fight on the main card, we have in the middleweight division, Carl Roberson versus Marvin Vittori. So to get straight to the point on this one right here, Roberson is a striker, Vittori is the grappler, but this is MMA, so they both have both skill sets. As we've seen in Roberson's last performance, we've seen his wrestling, we've seen his jiu-jitsu, as he was able to get the takedown after chewing up his opponent's leg, with Kapilov chewed up his leg, took him down, took his back, got him in the rear neck and choked. Vittori, we've seen him striking pretty much the last two fights, he's been standing up and striking, but we know he has that brown belt in jiu-jitsu, and not just any brown belt, but a solid, like, respected brown belt, not just somebody he just got from what, um... Who that one guy, but I don't know. Some, one of these guys that belts don't mean really much of anything. But yeah, he has, has a solid brown belt. So really, I, yes, they're more, both well-rounded fighters, but it's still a striker versus a grappler. And I think the gap between that grappling is bigger than the, gra the gap between their striking. And who has a grappling is Vittori. Who has a striker is Roberson. Roberson has some nice striking, some nice kickboxing, good elbow, like really sharp elbows, lots of powers. Good at cutting these angles and countering. I think early on, he will have success um, stifling Vittori a little bit on the feet. But I think over, at, eventually Vittori's pressure, his strength is going to overwhelm or start to, you know, win over, start to take over in this fight. That's basically what I'm saying. It's going to start to take over in this fight. We've seen Robeson. When we look at his losses in the UFC, they all came to grapplers. It's like solid grapplers. Not these guys that is freshly coming in. The, guys, the grapplers that he beat were fresh faces. Not guys that have been around a little bit. The grapplers that have beat him, I have people that at least had one or two or three fights in UFC and two or three wins, not just guys that just were just debuting. And Vittori fits the mold of the people that have beaten Roberson. Maybe he's not the best grappler among the people that have beaten him, but I think with his skill set, his striking, and his grappling mixed together along with his pressure, his strength, his size, I think he will be able to put Roberson in a lot of areas where he struggled before. But I still see this as a very competitive fight. Roberson has been showing a lot over these past couple fights. And in between the two, he definitely showed the ability to win these gritty fights. Whereas Vittori, usually he's either got a draw in these type of fights or he's lost these type of fights. I'm not saying he had so many of these fights. He had like two of them. He had Israel Asani, he lost. And I think he had that Russian guy who I don't really care for his name. At, well, Omar Akhmedov was a, just like a draw. But I think he should have went to him. But either way, he hasn't really been in these gritty fights. Whereas Roberson, I think these last three fights have been gritty. And I think he's been able to come out with the win. And his last one was real impressive. Chewed the leg up. He got eye poked. Only had one eye left. I mean, one good eye. And that third round was able to pull out a victory and get a submission in that third round, I believe. So, Robeson has definitely shown me more in those tight situations. But I'm still going to Vittori just off being a more well-rounded fighter. Or at least being a more overall better fighter, in my opinion. I see it's a competitive fight because Robeson is definitely a dog. But I think the grappling of Vittori, the control, the pressure is going to be what wins the fight. I think it's going to be a decision, but it's going to be a close one. But Vittori's control is going to win it over. The power punches in control, cage control, forward control is going to win him the fight. So in this fight, I got Marvin Vittori via decision. Now to our next fight we have in the Bantamweight division, Ricky Simone versus Ray Borg. So I'm going to get straight to the point of this one. Ray Borg has struggled to make 125 his whole career. And now he's fighting at 135. This is not the first time he's fought at 135, probably like second or third because he'd be missing weight. So they sent him up to 135 and then he had to test himself. I don't think he really went up to 135 and lost yet, but that's besides the point. How I see this fight right here. Ray Borg is a solid grappler. He's very aggressive, very tenacious. And he has a pretty solid striking as well, but his striking is definitely not his best skill set. And looking at his stat wise, he doesn't really put much output on the feet. It's more so just a couple strikes, like one or two, three strikes. Matter of fact, like. 20 strikes at most of in a three-round fight. Probably really like averaging like 10 strikes a fight or less. And then heavy takedown, heavy pe pressure, heavily like, you know, just heavy grappling. That's what he does. That's what he does. If we're going against Ricky Simone, who has solid wrestling, solid wrestling defense, pretty decent grappling as well. And then he has the better strike. And I think Ricky Simone can kind of have this fight like a Yaya fight where he's able to neutralize the takedown of Ray Borg and the grappling. And then kind of just... Work him on the feet. I'm not saying he's going to destroy Ray Borg on the feet. Just drop him and just pick him apart. But really stifle with the grappling attempts of Ray Borg and just outstrike him. I'm not saying I'll strike him out. I, I, like I'll strike him by a mile or just pick him apart. But this clearly be the fighter that's landing the significant strikes and, and not allowing the other fighter to take it to where he wants it to, to fight to go. And sorry about that alert, but I hate that stuff. These notifications be going off while you be in the middle, middle of a video and I'm not going to edit that out. But whatever the case is, Ricky Simone 
He's going to stifle Ray Borg's grappling for the most part. Even if it goes to the grappling, I think he'll be able to handle himself. But I think more so the, the story of this fight is going to be how Ricky Simone is able to defend the takedown and not allow Ray Borg to take it to the grappling aspects and allow and just really land the cleaner significant strikes and more strikes than Ray Borg by a significant clip where it's going to be clear enough that he's the one winning this fight. So in this fight, I got Ricky Simone via decision. Now to our next fight, we have in the lightweight division, Alexander Hernandez versus Drew Dober. So Drew Dober looking very good right now. He definitely, his striking has been tightened up. He's always been a striker and that's tightened up. His grappling has been tightened up a little bit. But I'm going to get to the point on this one too. Yes, Drew Dober's been looking good, but he still hasn't really beat a grappler. When we look at his career, every time he fights a grappler that's really enforces the grappling on him, he loses. And he loses pretty bad. Olivier Aubin Mercier beat him on a striking, then took him down to submit him. I think Benil Darius might have got tagged once in that fight, but really Darius just had his way with him on the ground, real easy work on the ground when it got to the ground. And when it got into the, the clinching, it was real easy work for Benil Darius. I think somebody else beat him. So, yeah, like, I think mean, Efren Escudero. So his grappling hasn't always never really been the best. Yes, he probably the better striker between Hernandez, and he's looking better as far as recent performances than Hernandez. But Hernandez is the bigger fighter, the younger fighter, the stronger fighter, and the more well-rounded fighter. Judoba strike is pretty good, but is he, is it, is it like, let me just get to the point that is, anything about Judoba really top tier? No. His strike is not top tier. His graph is not top tier. His mental IQ and none of that stuff, none of that stuff top tier. He's a middle of the, middle of the pack fighter at best. He might even win this fight, but he's a middle of the pack fighter at best. And he, I don't think he's middle of the pack. He's probably lower than the middle of the pack. Lightweight division is very deep, and he's not even... So, to say he's not even middle of the pack is pretty accurate. But at best, he's middle of the pack. Hernandez, about middle of the pack as well, but he has potential to go further. And I think he will. I think this fight, Hernandez versus Drew Dober, I think Hernandez is not going to allow Drew Dober to be in his range to really land those real good power shots or really consistently land those heavy leg kicks or anything. So, he's not going to be in there fighting a the distance or be up close and going for takedowns and initiating the grappling. I think he does both. And I think he wins a pretty clear decision with the control up close, like take him down, cage control, and just control him on the ground. And then get distance, he just like just lands his cleaner shots and not really allow Drew Dober to really land those power shots he wants to land or land consistently. And I think Hernandez beats him to a pretty clean decision. I don't think it's going to be like a wash, but it's going to be clear enough that Hernandez is the one landing the most significant strikes, landing the more, the more shots and the more significant shots to get to the point. And all with the cage control and the takedowns, and I'm really just control in general and takedown score that's going to win Hernandez the decision. So in this fight, I have Alexander Hernandez via decision. Now to our next fight, we have in the heavyweight division, our co-prelim headliner. Not co-prelim, this is the co-main event we have in the heavyweight division. Ben Roffel versus OSP. So look at this fight right here. OSP is coming up to, heavyweight, to the heavyweight division. But I don't really think he gains much by coming up. Because usually when you go up, you're the more technical fighter. You're already kind of like a technical fighter. Maybe you were cutting too much weight to make that weight. But you were a technical fighter. And maybe you were suffering from being not that fast or something. Like, say like um, Robert Whitaker. At welterweight, he was cutting too much weight. There were some guys faster than him. Or at least he, he couldn't take advantage of his, the speed he had. Because he was dealing with people like Wonder Boy, who was a better striker than him and faster than him. And then go up to middleweight. He's the faster guy. He's the more technical striker. He's fighting a lot of grapplers. And with his speed, he can avoid a lot of grappling attempts. With his cardio, he can pretty much just wear these grapplers out and then pick them apart on the feet. So it was an advantage. But OSP going up, he's not a high-paced fighter anyway, so he's not going to really have that much more cardio at, at heavyweight. He might be have a little bit more cardio because he's not cutting weight. But the main thing about OSP wasn't his cardio. It wasn't his technique. It wasn't his speed necessarily. It was that he was bigger than that, right? pretty much everybody in the division. He was able to cut down there and still be big and strong. But it was never really his technique. He had power. He was big. He was like 6'4", fighting guys like 6'1", 6'2". He was athletic. His technique was always sloppy, but he had power. So he was strong. People couldn't really, like, he could get get out by just being athletic and muscling people around or muscling himself out of situations. He did have some underrated grappling as far as top, like, top grappling. Bottom grappling, not so much, but top grappling, very much so. Especially with those Von flu choking the pressure and control as far as that matter goes. And some underrated takedown offense, but... Yeah, but going up, I don't really see nothing for him to gain. And now he's fighting a guy that's truly bigger than him. Like, Reyes was a little bit bigger than him, or maybe a little bit vertically bigger than him, but I think he was more filled out than Reyes, more filled out than Jones. So pretty much everybody else he fought was either around his size or smaller than him. Now he's going up and fighting a guy that's truly bigger than him. Like, he's the same height as um, 
Ralph, I think they're both around 6'4", maybe uh, Ralph was just a little bit taller. But Ralph was, is a true heavyweight. He's not a guy that can cut down and make 205. So you're fighting a guy that's bigger than you, might be stronger than you. A guy with a chin like Ben Roffle. Ben Roffle has taken a lot of shots. So when you see OSP, he wants a guy that he can knock out. And um, maybe with speed, he can catch Ben Roffle and knock him out. But really, Ben Roffle has taken shots from Mark Hunt. Has taken, like, not not even just little shots. Took big shots from Mark Hunt. Took big shots from Junior Santos. Took big shots from Andre Olowski. And a lot of other fighters. And he hasn't been knocked out in years. Like, last time he's been truly knocked out was Arlowski, like, 15 years ago. It's been a minute since he's been truly knocked out. So... That was against true heavyweights and some of the hardest hitters in MMA history. So I don't really see OSP having the best chance, chance of knocking him down. Really the best chance OSP has is uh, if he can successfully get takedowns and control him on top because I don't think Ben Roffle's that good off his back. But that's a tough task. Or maybe him just move. But OSP doesn't really have the best movement either. So you can't really say he'll fight him from distance, just be fast and keep touching him and then dipping out and stuff because he doesn't really, hasn't really shown no amazing footwork. More... And really, as far as footwork, he has a lot of smaller fighters to get in on him. So when you got a guy that's your same height, who doesn't need to get in to touch you? Like, your footwork is really going to be exposed. And really, Ben Roffle could just pressure him. And like, what is OSP going to have? He doesn't have no real good counter shots, except those little wide sweeping shots. And against a guy as tall as you are taller, that's not really going to work unless you're really moving your feet to get out of those, to create those angles to land those shots. But you're just throwing a shot from a, you know, just straight in front of somebody. That, punch, that straight punch is going to beat your punch. Especially if they're the same height as you. It might work against shorter guys, but a taller guy doesn't have to even enter nothing because they can punch you from the same range. But I'm talking a little bit too much, but basically what I'm saying, OSP has a good shot. But I think how I see this fight going, I think OSP has success, start, you know, because he'll be faster. He'll be unorthodox as usual. So he'll have success early. But Ben Rock was just going to keep coming, keep pressuring him. And really, this OSP going to start to slow down. Had to feel the weight of the, the weight and pressure of Ben Rock as the fight goes on, try to get him in clinches, pushing him back a lot. And then while OSP starts to wear down, he's going to try to go for a takedown. Then Ben Roffle puts him in his padded head, head, head to, I mean, head to stomach choke that he likes to put on people. I don't know the exact name. And I think he submits um, OSP in the third round. So in this fight, I got Ben Roffle via third round submission. Now to our main event, we have in the light heavyweight division, Anthony Smith versus Glover Teixeira. So I'm um, looking at this fight right here. Glover Teixeira is on a, managed to quietly get on three fight winning streak. Anthony Smith is coming off a win over Alexander Gustafsson, that seemingly retired Alexander Gustafsson. But past aside, it's not about the past. This is really a fight that's truly all about the present. Like you can say about the stats, but how I see this fight is more so about the present. As far as presently, Glover Teixeira definitely has a style that could have caused Smith a lot of issues. Probably like three years ago, he probably would have been an easy fight to pick Teixeira in this one. But in present day, it's an easy fight to kind of pick for Smith, in my opinion. Like Glover Teixeira has the power, he has the grappling, he has the boxing. And we've seen Smith, a lot of time he loses when guys just go pressure him and take him down and control him. Like when we saw it against Cesar Fiera at middleweight. I think mean, we saw it against um, Roger Gracie. We've seen it against pretty much a couple people. Like he's been taken down and controlled to the city or submitted. Or, you know, just people just pressure him and tag him up and he just kind of tap out or just gets broken down. But he hasn't been broken down that much in recent years, except maybe by John Jones. But other than that, not really, so he and maybe against Tiago Santos, who just hits hard and yeah. But Glover Shepard at this point, he never really been that explosive. He's he's never been that fast, and he's even slower now. You know that he's susceptible to the uppercut, and I think I Smith could sneak that like sneak that shot in there. So um, how's this fight really going? And Glover Shepard with his takedowns and control and then pressure. I think early on he could have success in controlling. Um, Smith, but I don't really see him having any success getting any real submissions off. We've seen Glover Teixeira's cardio start to fade a little bit more over these years. Like he doesn't have the same gas tank, he doesn't have the same durability. He's he can get he's more susceptible to getting hurt. So I think over time, Glover Teixeira is going to fade. Like he might have success at best, have some success early, but I think even early on this fight will be close. But I think Smith is just going to be fresh throughout. I'm not gonna only I'm not saying he's going to be have 100 percent cardio the whole fight, but I think he's going to be able to go. Keep his same pace throughout the fight, whereas Glover Sheriff's pace is going to significantly dip. So it's going to be semi competitive or somewhat competitive or competitive in general in these first three rounds. But I think it'll get to the fourth round or really the end of that third round to enter the fourth round. I think Smith can be the much fresher fighter. Glover Sheriff's not going to be able to get his takedowns as much or have much success with anything he's doing. And then Smith starts to really sneak those uppercuts in and starts to really up, like, pick up his volume. And I think he quickly, I mean, not quickly, but not too long after that, he puts Glover Sheriff out. So he starts to pick the pace up as Glover Sheriff starts to. 
tired, start to lean over a little bit more, start to breathe a little heavy, and mouth start to open, and you start to tag on those uppercuts, sneak those uppercuts in there, sneak some knees, some clinches, some elbows, and it's really just keep pushing the pace, and Glover Sheriff's not going to have the energy to really block or deal with the output that Smith is putting on. Not the footwork, not the head movement, not the reflexes, and, and not the energy to really deal with it. I think Smith just put some, like, put some weight in that fourth round, like, towards the, like, pretty much towards the end of the fourth round, Smith gets so towards the end of that fourth round, I see Smith putting away Teixeira via TKL strikes. So in this fight, I have Anthony Smith via fourth round TKL. And that concludes my fight prediction for the main card of UFC on ESPN, Smith versus Teixeira. And as always, thanks for watching.